international marketing and development at cables having spent around 15 years in publishing at emeril where he had direct experience in journal acquisitions open access and business development his background is in journalism and he has been published in academic journals on topics of bibliometrics and knowledge transfer he holds a master's degree in philosophy and international business and also has global experience lecturing to researchers on publishing strategies simon is also a tutor for the association of learned publishers and society publishers and a trustee for the community on publication ethics it is our pleasure to be hosting you sir today i would now re request you to please take the floor over to you sir simon <coughs> Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Sir, I hope you started recording this session. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's now recording. Um, you should be able to see my slides. Yes, sir, they are visible. Okay, great. So yeah, um, so today we're going to be talking about how to um, not only identify predatory publishing, but also to understand a little bit more about how it works, um, how to avoid being published in a predatory journal, and also how to develop some strategies overall about um, how to publish in the right journal. Um, so after a bit of a, an introduction to Cabell's, because I've, um, some of you probably haven't heard of Cabell's, um, we'll go into some background about how we define a predatory journal, um, the reasons why predatory journals are potentially so damaging to um, scholarly communications, um, the types of um, tricks they use um, to entice authors into publishing in them, um, what Cabell's does to, about this problem with our predatory reports database, and then finally we'll get into the more strategic aspects of how authors can, um, can use, hopefully use the information that I'm going to share to create a publishing strategy. Um, we'll have time, I think, at the end for Q&A. So if people want to put some questions in the chat function, um, and then we can come to those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, well, you've already heard about me, thank you, thanks to Ariba's introduction. Um, but to tell you about Cabell's, so Cabell's is a US company based in Texas which began life in the late 1970s, and it was developed by a, a professor called Dr. Dave Cabell, who's still the owner. And what he wanted to do is that he wanted to identify the types of journal that he would recommend to fellow um, researchers in business and management. So he created a directory, and in those days it was a, a, a single volume directory. And then over years that they, they added lots of different volumes as they expanded the coverage. And then um, they went online in the 2000s. And now the, the same kind of directory is now a large database, which includes over 11,000 uh, good quality journals across most disciplines. So business and management, um, and then it's grown into all the other social sciences and into uh, more um, STEM subjects as well. Uh, and in fact, next year we're going to add medical journals, which is a huge component. So we should have over 16,000 journals uh, next year. But we also have a um, relatively new product called um, Predatory Reports, which is a, um, a large data, a database of nearly 14,000 journals. Um, we're about to go over that 14,000 journal mark. Um, when we launched the database in 2017, it was only 4,000 journals. So as you can see, it's grown quite rapidly and we still have uh, many more um, journals that we need to review. So lots more work to do still. So how do we define um, a, um, a predatory journal? So mainly we, um, a predatory journal is basically some, um, a journal that is trying to deceive the author. And the first person to identify this was somebody called um, Jeffrey Beale, who uh, wrote um, a lot in the 2000s and early 2010s about the issue of predatory journals. He was the person who, who came up with the term predatory journal. Um, and he was the person who really kind of brought a lot of attention in the scholarly community to the problem of predatory journals. 
Um, he actually created something called Beale's List, which people may have heard of. Beale's List was a list that he maintained just by himself online of about a thousand journals and about a thousand publishers that he thought were potentially predatory in nature. Um, and so he's really kind of the, probably one of the biggest names associated. He, however, in early 2017, he closed down his list and he's actually now retired as a, as a librarian. Um, and so he, he that list, um, even though you can find versions of it online, um, has not been updated for a long time. Um, so it's a, uh, um, it still has some uses in terms of identifying journals, but it isn't up to date and it, it never was really kind of verified in terms of um, a, a transparent set of criteria to decide whether a journal was, was predatory or not. Um, so that's really the background of, of how predatory journals have, have developed. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of a definition of a predatory journal, it's actually quite difficult to do that because there are so many different types. A, a good kind of rough and ready way is perhaps to describe it as an opportunistic publishing venue or publishing platform that exploits the academic need to publish, but offers little reward for those using services. So the two things there really are about the, the kind of, um, the, one of the drivers which is what we would call the publish or perish scenario. Um, in India, as elsewhere, authors need to need to publish. And um, because they need to publish, then often they will make, um, they won't make the good decisions really in terms of the journal that they publish in. Um, often they just need to get something published and they don't really check the type of journal they're publishing in. Um, and we're going to talk about this in a bit more detail shortly. Um, and what we do is what we try to, when we uh, look into all of these different journals, then we look behind what's going on with those journals and behind their websites and try to understand the, the various motivations and methods that are used. And broadly speaking, there are five of these motivations and methods that enable us to identify whether a journal is, is predatory or not. So firstly, um, you have to understand that the only reason that predatory journals have been set up is to make money. So um, they will be charging fees, uh, so-called APCs or article processing charges. Now, it's really, really important to understand that um, they, predatory journals and predatory publishers, they exploit the open access model, but there is nothing inherently bad or, or, or evil or anything like that about open access. Open access is a perfectly legitimate model to get published. Um, it's an alternative publishing model. And all it is, is that it offers the author the opportunity for an, their article to be openly accessible to everybody with an internet connection. So that's the primary um, intent for an open access article. Um, now, what predatory publishers did in the early 2000s when they started to set themselves up, because authors were starting to understand open access and start to send their articles off and pay in order for them to be published and made freely available to everybody, because that payment shifted from the subscription model, which has traditionally been the main model of, of access of academic content, to the author pays model, then they exploited that and took advantage and started to offer um, an opportunity for authors to publish, but they weren't offering them the services that they would, um, they would expect from a regular publisher. So there's no link at all between open access and predatory publishing other than predatory publishers exploit the open access model. And then that is it's a very, uh, it's a criminal way to make money, but it, is, it can be quite a lucrative way to make money. Now, secondly, is um, they do not care about the quality of the articles they publish. So really, the more they would care about the quality of the articles they published, the more money they would have to spend on it. And they want to spend as little money as possible on publishing the article. So ideally, they want to copy and paste the Word document that you send them um, into a PDF and put their PDF online. 
And that's that's as simple as that. Um, now, some people might think that's all publishers do, but um, having worked with a publisher for 15 years, um, that's definitely not just all they do. Uh, there's a huge amount of work that goes into um, the peer review process, the, um, the proofreading, the typesetting, the copy editing, um, putting metadata behind the article, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They don't do any of that, and they don't care if your article is the best article ever written or the worst article ever written. Um, they will simply just publish it. Um, so there's no quality uh, barrier at all. So anybody can publish anything. The third um, kind of method, if you like, is that they often make false claims and promises. Usually this will involve them saying that the journal is peer reviewed when it isn't. They will say that the journal is, um, is indexed. Uh, typically, they'll say it either has um, an impact factor or some type of impact factor, um, and that's simply false. Um, you can easily check if a journal has um, an official impact factor. Impact factors are given to journals that are indexed by the Web of Science, and the Web of Science is a product developed by uh, Clarivate Analytics. Every journal that has an impact factor is listed on a website, and if you uh, Google master journal list Clarivate. Um, the master journal list is, as you would expect, the master list of all the journals that Clarivate and Web of Science um, indexes in its database. And it will tell you the impact factor from a year previous. And um, so you can easily check whether any claims that a journal makes uh, of having an impact factor or not, simply by looking at the master journal list website. Um, they often say that they've got a different type of impact factor. Some even say they've got a Google impact factor or something like that. There are simply no other impact factors. You can make an impact factor up and you can invent a uh, calculation, but there are no other impact factors out there that, make, that really mean anything. Um, the only impact factor that's worth anything is the um, the Clarivate Analytics Web of Science Impact Factor. One thing that people don't realize is that they are often engaging in unethical business practices, not simply by offering predatory journals, but they are often linked to criminal gangs. Um, the operation um, can be quite lucrative, as I said, and it is a way of earning uh, quick cash for those people who've got the skill to set up a predatory journal and operate it. Um, so, they it's not see merely people who don't really know what they're doing or looking just to make a quick book um, sometimes there's quite sinister people involved in these journals and finally they don't follow any of the accepted standards or best practices um, you would expect in scholarly publishing so for example um, what they won't do is that they um, they won't archive your content so your article may be published tomorrow um, but it may not be there in a week or a month or a year. Um, there's simply no, um, there's no reason for them to actually um, keep the article published as it is. Um, and often what we see is that they often delete the content or they simply close the website down and move on and do something else in a slightly different website. Um, most, if well, all legitimate publishers actually um, undertake to maintain access to the articles they published um, into eternity, forever. Um, and they make this kind of promise to authors as part of the agreement of, for them to publish their article. Um, illegitimate journals don't do that. So those are the kind of main motivations and methods that help you to identify what is a predatory journal. Now, um, Looking to India specifically, there's um, some kind of quite a lot of research out there now about predatory publishing, and some of it does relate to India. And there's a couple of things that I want to highlight to you. As we said, <clears throat> they're not just, um, they're exploiting the open access model and specifically the gold open access model. So that's the model where the author typically pays an APC to publish their article. And what we see is that this happens globally um, they're one of the kind of seminal articles published on predatory journals was by Bjork and Shen in 2015. And what they did was that they looked at a subset of predatory journals 
and they kind of extrapolated that out in terms of what the impact of predatory journals were. And uh, <clears throat> what they saw was that actually India had the highest rate of articles published uh, from, from, from Indian authors. Um, it was the country with the highest rates of, of publication, um, bigger than North America, bigger than Europe and Africa. Um, some articles, it was actually impossible to determine where the authors were from, um, but certainly India was the biggest one. And secondly, what we know from our own research when we look at the, the Predatory Reports database, we're able to identify that the, the country with the single biggest number of journals based there uh, seems to be India. And now sometimes it's difficult to identify where a journal is based. Often a journal will call itself the American Journal or the British Journal or something um, and say that they're based um, in America or in the UK. Um, but when you check out their address um, and when you do some digging around their URL, you find out that actually they're not based where they say they're based. Um, they're often based in India. That's one of the, um, the kind of countries that has the highest number of these journals. Um, and we've done some research recently, and my, this is, and my colleague Snail, who's on the call, has, has been starting to look at this. And we've seen that um, in India as well, um, some people might think, well, it's maybe the, the kind of lower quality universities and the, the academics based at those universities that are publishing these journals, but that's not necessarily the case. So for example, there are more than 20 predatory journal articles have been published by authors from the NITs in the last two years. Um, and it's not just the NITs, it's across the board, we see um, a significant number of publications from authors based in, in even the top ranked universities. Um, and that's not just the case in India either. Um, that's also the case um, in other countries, but it does seem that the prevalence in India is quite high. <clears throat> now, sometimes we get some uh, pushback about predatory journals and, and the question is really, well, what's the harm? Um, so what if people want to use a fast and cheap way to publish their research? Um, or they may say, isn't some of the research actually quite good in some of these predatory journals? Um, and indeed, sometimes it gets um, you know, cited quite significantly. Um, and this is true, but there are some major dangers about publishing in predatory journals. That, and there are just three here that we'd like to highlight. Firstly, um, as I mentioned before, the work is typically not subject to peer review, or if it is, it is subject to peer review, it's definitely not robust peer review. And what that means is that you simply can't trust anything that's published in a predatory journal. Um, it is genuinely a fake journal and nothing can be trusted uh, within the journal itself. So it may be that somebody publishes an article that the research is sound and the findings are sound, and it could actually be you know, very beneficial for people to read this article. But because it hasn't gone through peer review, then it's very difficult to trust those findings um, compared to a legitimate journal that has a tried and trusted peer review process. Secondly, as I mentioned before, the work that is published there could actually simply disappear. And we have um, a high, very high number of journals on the Predatory Reports database that are so-called empty journals. So um, journals that have been set up and either have never published anything or they've published things and then suddenly that content has disappeared. Um, so those journals are active and people are um, sending their, uh, their articles into the journals, they're submitting their work to be published, but it then disappears and does, or, or never appears in the first place. Finally, um, and this is one of the kind of really key things that people should understand, is that even if you do publish your article in a predatory journal, and even if it is really good research, then actually it's very difficult to find because predatory journals, they don't spend any time or, or effort, they don't invest in the articles they publish. So what they don't do is something called SEO or search engine optimization. Now, if you publish with a journal published by Elsevier or Wiley or Springer Nature or Hindawi, then they will actually spend a lot of time and effort and money um, putting metadata into the article or behind the article. And that metadata enables the Google algorithm to find your article um, if, the, if the search is relevant and for your article to appear high up on the search. So you're in the top two or three pages of the search. 
Now, this is really important because there's lots of research that's been done that shows that firstly, um, approximately two thirds of all research that is kind of found. So in other words, two thirds of the articles um, that people visit are found through Google. It's, it's that dominant. So being able to be found by the Google algorithm is really important. Um, so if you, and then the, the flip side of that is that if you don't have that metadata behind the article and your article isn't found in the few, first few pages, the evidence is that very few people go beyond two or three pages, 20 or 30 um, hits. Um, they usually find enough for their, whatever they're doing in those first 20 or 30 hits. And therefore anything that appears lower down um, isn't going to get found, isn't going to get used, isn't going to get cited, et cetera. So you're, you're kind of really burying the article and all that hard work that you put into the article is kind of for nothing. Um, these journals also, they often say that they're part of um, an index. So by definition, if a journal has an impact factor, it is indexed in the web of science. There are other indexes out there, um, for example, Scopus and the Cabell's Journalistics Database I mentioned earlier. These indexes are, um, are trustworthy. They um, collate a large amount of content. They're transparent. Um, they contain journals that are, would be recommended to other people. Um, but despite lots and lots of claims that appear on predatory journals, they tend not to be indexed in these databases. Um, sometimes they claim falsely they are, but usually they're, they're not. So it's very, very hard to find if you can't find it via a Google search or via um, a search in a, one of the kind of more popular databases. Now, predatory publishing has been in the news quite a lot in the last year or two. Um, just to highlight a couple of the interesting stories that have come out, perhaps the biggest story was the Federal Trade Commission in America, um, and they uh, found a probably the biggest um, predatory publisher in the world called Omics International, which unfortunately is based in India. Um, they found it guilty of essentially defrauding authors over a six year period. Now, predatory um, Omics International has around at least 700 predatory journals. And the Federal Trade Commission found that for the, all the authors publishing in its journals, they were, were defrauding those authors because they were saying and they were making claims as to the quality of the journal, about their peer review processes, etc. But they were lying. Um, there was no quality in their process. Um, they weren't indexed in the the indexes that they say the word, etc. So they weren't giving the service that any kind of author would expect they would receive. And as a result, um, they were charged, uh, they were fined um, just over $50 million. So that $50 million represents all of the APCs authors paid to Omics journals in a six year period. Um, so as you can see, it's quite lucrative for predatory publishers. Um, at Cabell's, we've done some kind of analysis of the um, of the result of this uh, investigation by the FTC, and we estimate that um, if you if you kind of look at the Omics journals and how much money authors were spending on them, and you extrapolate that to to all the journals that we have on the Omic, on the um, Cabell's Predatory Reports database, you're looking at between 100 and 150 million dollars being spent every year on EPCs by authors. So that's a, a huge amount of money. And it's important to realize that that money is usually, it's money that comes from um, universities. Um, it's money that comes from um, the, uh, the, the authors themselves, or it's money that comes from funding agencies. Um, but either way, it's um, a huge waste of money um, because as we've seen, there's literally, there's no point in, in publishing your article because it, it won't get found um, and it, it won't probably won't be, be used at all. Another interesting story was in Germany that found that over 5,000 um, German um, academics had published in these journals. 
And interestingly, a few of those authors were, were employees of really major companies. Um, and indeed, they were from um, pharmaceutical and um, automobile companies. And the thinking was, is that they um, were publishing the research that their, their companies had, had developed. And they were simply publishing the research to say that the research that was behind those companies' products were published. But obviously, there's a difference between publishing in a predatory journal that isn't peer reviewed and publishing in a journal like Nature, for example, that has an extremely um, rigorous peer review. So um, the it's not just the case that authors get sucked into this and are innocent victims. Sometimes we see that authors are actually using predatory publishers for their own ends to get published. So at Cabell's, this is our answer to the problem um, or part of an answer to the problem. And we have the, the uh, predatory reports database. So we have um, over 70 behavioral indicators that help us to identify whether a journal um, is published or not. And essentially they're based on those five um, motivations and methods that I talked about earlier. So when we get, we have no, a huge number of journals that are recommended to us, or we have a big backlog of journals that we go through. And what we do is we look at the journal and we don't, we, we look at the journal's website and things, and we test the website out, but we also try to contact the journal. Um, now often, the journal never contacts us back, um, which is one other indicator that we have. Um, but it's usually quite easy and straightforward to see how it breaches um, our criteria. So on this particular journal, this is one of the journals from Omics International. Um, and you can see that sometimes the problem is quite insidious. So we here we see that the publisher hides or obscures relationship with for-profit partner companies. The typical things that look at on a website for example, it doesn't have a physical address for the publisher, it gives a fake address. And sometimes their practices. So for example, emails from journals received by researchers are clearly not in the field the journal covers. So many of you will have this phenomenon on a regular basis where you are a, um, an English literature professor and you are invited to submit your article to a journal about oncology or something. Um, that's a predatory journal that's doing that. They've got your details from somewhere. And what they do is that they just send out vast numbers of emails. And all they need is just a very small percentage of hits of people to reply to those emails and submit an article. And they don't care that they, they you know, that their oncology journal is, is, and they've sent an email to you as an English literature professor. It's just a kind of a scattergun approach. They're just firing everything out there and they'll get a small percentage of people who will come back submit their article, pay a few hundred dollars for that submission, and they just need 20, 30, 50 people to do that, and then they'll publish those, and often they'll actually move on and do the whole thing again on a different uh, identity. Um, but that's one of the, again, one of the methods that they use to attract authors. Um, now, the Predatory Reports database is a subscription product. Um, but what you as authors can do is firstly, go to your librarians, please, at your universities and see if they can get a subscription. But if not, you can use the selection policy yourself. So thinking about the kinds of things that we've just been talking about here, you can go to um, cabells.com, our website, and look at the selection policy. And you can see those 70 plus behavioral indicators yourself. And if you're thinking about submitting to a journal, then you can um, look at those criteria and apply them yourself. Um, and if you've got a number of suspicions with regards to those criteria, then it's probably better for you to think, okay, this is potentially a predatory journal, maybe choose something else. Now, this is what a typical predatory journal website um, looks like. And at first glance, it looks like a lot of other journal websites. Um, it's reasonably well put together. Um, and it's got what the kind of links you would expect. So it's got special issues, um, up to date special issues there about COVID-19. Aims and scope and citations and table of contents and submit your paper. So those are the types of things you would expect. 
But what you really need to do um, about the predatory journals is you need to not just look more in depth at their journal website, but you need to look behind the website. So firstly, right in the middle there, we've got Margaret Stack, the editor-in-chief of the journal, and she's a professor at the University of Strathclyde in the UK. Now, if you Google her, you will, you will find that um, Margaret Stack is a professor at the University of Strathclyde in the UK, and she is a professor in automobile engineering. But when you look at the uh, her kind of like list of publications and things, you'll see that she is listed as an editor in chief of a journal, but not this journal. She's the editor in chief of a different journal published by a major publisher um, of some reputation. So what this journal has done is effectively stolen her identity. Um, and you can kind of see that because the would a journal have such a bad picture of their editor on the website? Um, it's really poor quality. Um, and you'll see that because they've, they've copied and pasted it from somewhere else. If you go up to the, the, to her, the, to the left of her, there's a, uh, a Dr. Mohabid Kachau, Associate Professor in Tunisia. Now there's a couple of things here that again, they're indicators that will tell you that this journal is perhaps not all it seems to be. Why is his surname all in capitals? And then the Margaret Stack and the other gentleman, their surnames are not in capitals. Why is he associate professor with a lowercase p, but the other two are editor in chief and executive editor with, with fully um, capitalized words? When you actually look again at his identity, so he's a real professor in Tunisia, but again, He's an editorial board member of a completely different journal. So again, you have to ask yourself, why would a good journal make such basic errors about the one of their major editors? Again, why is he listed as doctor and Margaret Stack and Etienne Rubong, who are presumably they're also doctors, but they don't have the doctor there. So just because there are three mistakes under that gentleman's picture. It doesn't mean it's a predatory journal. What it does mean is that those are three fairly strong indicators that it might be. And when you build up a picture of all these different, all these anomalies, then you can, so you can start to see that this journal isn't what it looks like. The final thing I want to draw your attention to is at the top right. So firstly, it has an ISSN. Um, an ISSN means nothing. Um, about 40% of the journals that we have in predatory reports have got an ISSN. And all it means is that they have either made one up, which happens quite often, or that they have obtained a genuine ISSN from the ISSN agency. But ISSN don't check if a journal is predatory or not. They simply check if a journal is active or not. And if they see that a journal has been set up and is active, they'll ascribe an ISSN. It doesn't mean that that journal is legitimate at all. Secondly, there is a phone number. Now you have to ask yourself, why does an academic journal need a phone number? And more specifically, why is that phone number a UK mobile number? Why would you need to phone a mobile number in the UK? If you're in India, that could cost you a lot of money if you were going to phone, but, but why would you phone? Now, the only reason that we can think of is that phoning them is a quick way to pay the APC. Um, and so that's why these journals tend to have phone numbers on there. And often when you go to them, not only do they have a phone number, they have a little chat box that pops up. Um, and again, we, we, we believe that it's just in order to um, expedite payment. That's all that that is there. If you go to a journal published by Elsevier or Wiley, you won't find any email, um, any phone numbers there. You'll find email addresses, for example, of the um, of the editor. And again, that's another anomaly. Usually, you would find the email address of the editor there, so that you can contact them. But there's no email address here. So, as you can see, once you start to look behind the Predatory Journal website, you can you can start to identify a lot of problems. Final thing, actually, there, when you it says there, share this page again, a kind of typical social media thing you'd be used to. You would see that on a regular journal, 
But what you wouldn't see is that those actual um, links there are, don't work. So this journal doesn't have a Facebook page or a Twitter account or LinkedIn, etc. They're just there for show. Um, again, a real journal, when you clicked on those, you would be taken through to Facebook and Twitter, etc., and see a genuine account. Now, finally, just to kind of pull all of these things together, we've talked really a, a, a kind of, if you like, about the negative side of things. Um, but what you can also do is that in terms of your own publishing strategy, then you also need to look at the positive side of things. So firstly, as authors, then I would very much recommend that you have a, a kind of um, a definable publishing strategy where you look forward and you kind of set goals for yourself in terms of how many articles you want to publish, how many citations you want those articles to achieve, which types of journals you want to publish in, etc. That strategy may fit in with the kinds of journals that your institution expects. It may be the ones, journals that you would like to publish in, anything like that, it's up to you, but um, it's definitely better to have a strategy than not to have a strategy. Now, obviously part of that strategy would be to avoid predatory journals. And we've talked a lot about that, but then also you need a kind of a strategy that identifies the good journals you want to publish in. Now, as I mentioned, um, Cabell's has something called Journalytics. This is a database of 11,000 journals. And what we do is we pull together the type of information that we feel is useful to you as an author when you're deciding on your publishing strategy. So you can see in this particular journal here, it's an accounting and finance uh, journal called Healthfully Accounting and Finance. And what it tells you here is that things like there is a 15 to 20% acceptance rate. So it may be that you compare two journals and one of them has a, an 80% acceptance, acceptance rate and one has a 20% acceptance rate. All things being equal, if you're choosing between those two journals, then you may as well choose the one with the high acceptance rate. You're going to have better chances of publishing in there if those two journals fit your criteria. Also, you may be in, in a hurry. You want to publish as soon as possible. And this journal is actually relatively quick for a management journal. Um, only one to three months in terms of publication, two to three months in terms of um, time to review. So you could get a reasonably fast turnaround here. But maybe that you're, you want a, a journal that is quite... Um, is, um, has a lot of uh, social media activity. You want to kind of look at the wider impacts of, the, of your article. So we include um, something called altmetrics. So what we have here is we have an average figure of the number of kind of shares that the, uh, an individual article has from that journal through the different social media um, outlets. Now, other databases are available which have different types of information. So we've talked about the Web of Science that has information, uh, really detailed information about citation activity. Um, we have the Scopus, which is a, a really huge database. It's, it's very, very big, it's more than 30,000 journals. That has a broader range of coverage and again, looks at citation activity in a slightly different way. There's a number of, of, of well-respected databases out there that help you build a picture of the types of journals that you should be um, targeting. So the last thing I wanted to say really, and this is really kind of the whole point for the whole lecture, is that um, you are all uh, experts in your field. You're all expert researchers. You've all got very high levels of research skill. But what we tend to see um, is that academics around the world, they don't use those skills to research the journals that they want to publish in. So they will drill down, drill down and be really, really rigorous in the research that they're doing about their subject area, but they don't apply that same rigor to finding out about the journals that they want to publish in. So whether you have access to these kinds of databases or not, you can still do your own research to find out exactly what type of journal you're submitting to. And hopefully by doing that, you're not going to make the mistake of publishing in a predatory journal. So that's the end of the lecture. Uh, thank you for your, for your time today. And I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'm gonna go to the uh, questions, on, hopefully the questions on the chat. Um, and I'm also gonna just 
rarely for the UK we have a sunny day today, so I'm just going to pull the blinds down. Better. So there's a question there for um, about does Cabell's has have a list of predatory journals published from India? So yes and no. Um, what we do so in our the database we have a list of journals um, and for each journal where we can identify where it's from then we will list where that journal is from so sometimes we put something like we'll say usa question mark because we all after our research then it looks like the journal is trying to say it's from america but we've got suspicions that it might not be so sometimes it's very difficult to identify where the journal is but you can search our database um, for the country of origin. So for example, um, I, did a, um, I did one of these webinars recently in, for authors in the Ukraine. So, you know, as part of you know, the, the preparation for the talk, I looked at the, um, how many journals we had from the Ukraine and I can't, there weren't many. There was kind of single figures, three or four maybe, that's all. Um, so that was good for, you know, obviously that showed that there weren't many, um, that wasn't a particularly active area as far as we could see uh, in terms of predatory publications. Um, but if we were to do that for India, then unfortunately it would be a big number. It would be in the thousands, the number of journals from, from India. Um, Omics International, um, then that journal publisher alone has more than 700 journals. And we know that Omics International, even though often it says that it is based in America, uh, we know that it's not based in America, it's based in India. And sometimes they give fake addresses. So there's one address that one of its, because um, they have imprints, so they don't all, always say that they are published by Omics International. So the journal I showed you just there was a journal published by uh, Longdon. And Longdon is one of the imprints uh, used by um, Omics International. Um, sometimes they'll give an address, one of the Omics International addresses is in Texas. And so, you know, we kind of looked at that thinking, oh, well, this is, you know, is this based near to our head office near Houston? But when you look at the address they gave, it is literally what they call in America an empty lot. In other words, there's nothing there. Um, it's just a, you know, you, it's a bit of spare ground on the outskirts of a town. Um, so it has an address, that's that empty lot, perhaps that used to be a building there or something, but there's nothing there now. Um, so again, by using a little bit of your research skill, you can often identify this. Um, we, we recently wrote a blog actually um, about another publisher that said it was based in, in, in the UK, in the south of England. Um, and when we looked at it, so this major international publisher with dozens of journals published was being published in a two bedroom terraced house in a small town called Gillingham, which I don't know if anybody's ever been to Gillingham, but it is not a, a kind of a hotbed of academic publishing activity. Um, they just simply, I don't know why, they may, maybe picked it at random or maybe they use it simply as like a PO box, but it certainly wasn't the base of, of an international publisher. So um, you do have to kind of, as I said, look behind the details that they publish on a website and basically assume that what they're saying is potentially false until you can verify it. There's another question now. Um, could you please elaborate on impact factor and how one could use the information to identify predatory journals? So two things really. So firstly, when you look at a journal and the journal says it has an impact factor, then you need to check whether it has an impact factor. So as I said, never believe what you read and always kind of check it. So um, when you see that a journal says it has an impact factor, then you go to uh, the master journal list, um, which is operated by Clarivate Analytics. Um, and that is a list of all the journals with impact factors. And then you can then check if the journal that you're looking at is on there or not. Now, as I said, sometimes it is, um, they will fake the impact factor. So they'll say that it's something else. I saw yes, yesterday, 
I was looking at a journal and it said it had an SG impact factor. Now, I'm, I'm telling you now, there are no other impact factors that mean anything. So um, even if somebody has created a new impact factor, you need to kind of look behind that and try and find out, well, if there is a new impact factor, then A, Clarivate may sue them <laughs> uh, because it's a trademark. And B, um, why, how is that impact factor being calculated? It's actually really, really difficult to set up a database that will report on citation information. It's, it's a huge undertaking, which costs a lot of money to set up. So um, there really is only one impact factor. So to me, if I saw a journal that said it had an impact factor and I checked the impact factor and, and it didn't, then I would be 99% certain that journal um, would be a predatory journal. There's a, it's possible that it might not be. It might be just that they're using that they're being unwise in saying what kind of data that they have on the journal, but it's more than likely that, you know, that they're trying to uh, make the journal appear better than it is. So as a follow-up question, how can we get the true impact factor not from the journal website? So, um, okay. There, so just to kind of go kind of back. So there is a, a large company called Clarivate Analytics, Clarivate Analytics has a wide number of products. One of those products is called the Web of Science. The Web of Science is a huge database of carefully selected um, academic journals across all disciplines. I think in total there's about 13,000 journals that they, they index on the database. And on that database, they have a vast amount of information about the journal and about the citations of that journal. And specifically it's citations of that journal that appear in all the other journals on Web of Science. Um, and it's kind of the kind of the creme de la creme, the elite um, index of journals. Uh, it's very selective and very difficult to get your journal um, indexed on there. Only the Web of Science produces the impact factor. Um, it, to get very specific, there is a product that is within the Web of Science called Journal Citation Reports or JCR. And JCR is the list of all the journals on there with all of the citation information. The master journal list <clears throat> is also a list of all the journals, but it has a limited um, amount of citation information. So for example, it has an embargoed impact factor. So it only tells you the impact factor of a year ago and, and before that. So if you look at a journal now, you'll find the journal impact factor for 2018 you won't find it for 2019. Impact factors are published the year after where all the citation activity happens. So the latest impact factor that you can get is a 2019 impact factor today. Um, on the Master Journalist, you'll only find the 2018 impact factor, but nevertheless, you'll find the impact factor. You'll find if it has an impact factor or not. That's the only source of the true impact factor. A journal will, no doubt, if a journal has a genuine impact factor, it will more than likely have that impact factor on its website. But what I'm saying is that you can't trust that. If it's an Elsevier journal or a Wiley journal, then, then maybe you can trust it. Um, although there are a number of journals in our database that have uh, that are actually hijacked journals. So what they're doing there is that the predatory publisher hijacks the identity of the journal. So if you have, for example, the Journal of Oncology, then they will hijack the identity. They'll essentially copy and paste the website to another website, and they'll try and direct traffic away from the genuine journal to the hijacked journal. So they would actually say that that journal has an impact factor. And that's, that's true of the original, the genuine journal, but what they're doing is they're hijacking it. And they'll say, instead of saying, well, if you send us your journal, you pay us $2,000, which is the kind of average for a, a legitimate um, journal for open access. They'll say, well, you pay us $200 and we'll publish it tomorrow. Whereas the genuine journal will say, we'll publish it, pay us $2,000 and we'll publish it next year. Um, in those instances, it doesn't happen very often. I think at the moment we have eight hijacked journals on our database. When that happens, 
Um, it's very difficult to identify if that journal is, is, is the true one or the hijacked one. Um, however, the, um, the master journalist hasn't been hijacked and that is the only place that you can get that verified information. So there's a few more things that have come in. Um, what if a predatory journal and a genuine journal have the same ISSN number? Googling the name of the genuine journal may end up in the website of the predatory journal with the same title and ISSN, which is, that's exactly what I've just been saying about the hijacked journals. How to make sure that we're not submitting our articles to the predatory journal. So what you need to do, it's a really good point that, is that you need to, um, rather than use Google, you need to go in to the journal via the publisher. Because when they hijack a journal identity, they can't hijack the journals, sorry, the publisher's identity because the publisher has, uh, will have a, a large number of websites and, and usually they have you know, potentially a large number of journals. They can't copy and paste that entire network of websites. They can only copy and paste one site. So if you go in via the actual publisher and then the publisher will have say a drop down of all their journals and then go to that journal that way, then you can guarantee. Um, what I would say is that if you if the if you do go to a journal that seems to be legitimate and is published by a major publisher or is very very well known and got a good reputation, you've heard that from numerous sources, and they tell you things like, "We'll publish you tomorrow. Um, you only it's only two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars for an APC. Give us a call now." that should raise your suspicions. And then if you have your suspicions raised, then maybe to double check, go into the journal via the, via the publisher rather than straight into the journal. And that's, that's as good a way as of trying to avoid that problem as possible. Um, somebody with two questions. Firstly, what are the ethical implications of having accidentally published in a predatory journal? <clears throat> Secondly, a work that's been published in a predatory journal, can it be resubmitted to a reputable journal? Okay, um, this is a, one of the most common questions we get, and I'm afraid that the news is kind of bad. <laughs> the ethical implications of accidentally publishing in a predatory journal are exactly the same as the ethical implications of um, publishing in a predatory journal on purpose. Um, a bit like an athlete that's been caught cheating with drugs, it's no defense to say that you didn't know that you were taking the drugs um, or that somebody else gave them to you or anything like that. Unfortunately, the ethical implications are that you have published in a predatory journal and then that publication stands. You can try and retract it. Um, so you can, you can go and try and contact the predatory journal and ask for it to be retracted. But usually one of two things happens if you try and do that. Firstly, then they'll ignore you and you can't contact them. However many emails or phone calls you make, they won't, you can't contact them. Secondly, if you do contact them, they'll say to you, yeah, sure. We can retract it. That's going to cost you a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and basically they'll extort the money from you in order to retract the article. And even then, if you pay, there's no guarantee that they're actually going to do that. Like I said, these are not nice people. So, so the ethical implications are are bad. The only thing that you can do is to try and retract it and just be as honest as possible to anybody that you need to talk to, whether it's your, your dean, your head of department, uh, future employer, whatever, and say, I made a mistake. There's this article that I, that I once published in a predatory journal. I made a mistake. I'm never going to do it again. Um, the only kind of silver lining to that is because of what I was saying about the, the lack of metadata, et cetera. It's unlikely that article will ever be found um, or will be repub um, will be um, cited very much. It's better to take the the research that you published in that article, redo the research, improve the research, differentiate the research substantially, and publish that article um, or the the essence of the article. Publish it in another journal, but in a, a, in a different article completely. So completely rewrite the article with improved. Um, uh, with improved research and different research. So at least you then kind of, you're taking that article as a base, write that off, you publish a different article in a much better legitimate journal. So at least the research that you did for that article hasn't been lost completely. But, and this goes to your second point, 
What you cannot do is that if you publish in a predatory journal, you cannot resubmit the same article to a reputable journal. That's dual publication. That's just as bad in terms of publication ethics. Um, you, you know, simply put, two wrongs don't make a right. So if you do publish in a journal accidentally, in a predatory journal, whatever you do, do not um, try and publish the same article in another journal, because that's just doubling the problem. Like I said, take the essence of the original research, develop it, improve it, write, rewrite the entire article, um, make sure it's significantly different to the original article, don't plagiarize yourself at all, and then submit the new article to a different journal. Um, that's that's the only real way that you can get around it and just have to put your hand up and say, yeah, I made a mistake. I published in that uh, in a predatory journal. Um, next question, if a journal has a list of editorial board members, but doesn't have any email and uh, doesn't have any mail addresses or way to contact them, is it a trustworthy journalist? Or trustworthy journal, maybe. Um, possibly, but probably not. Um, again, all you need to do is go to what are called the big five publishers, um, Elsevier, Taylor and Francis, Wiley, Springer Nature, and I always remember four of them, <laughs> one of those publishers. Um, look at those journals. Elsevier's got nearly 3,000 journals. It's got plenty to, to choose from. And look at their editorial board members. Look in the subject area that you're familiar with. Um, do they have email addresses? Probably. Um, you should be able to contact all of them. Sometimes the editorial board, they may not have that, but the, the upper echelons of the board, so the editor, the associate editors, um, kind of the any type of editorial assistant, the editorial office, um, any senior editors, usually they will have um, contact addresses there. <clears throat> so it's certainly um, potentially a problem if the editorial board members don't have any email addresses, but I would kind of, if they don't, I would put that to one side and then look at some of the other indicators that we've been talking about today. Um, one international journal, Indian, was in UGC care list until 2019, but now isn't. Can we trust the UGC care list? That's, that's, that's a leading question if ever I heard one. Um, so all I know about the UGC care list is that it has, um, it's been, there's been a huge amount of work that's been put into that in, in recent times. Um, and it is much more trustworthy than the previous incarnation, um, because I know that there are a lot of problems with the, with the, old, the old version of that. So um, that's, that's a good thing. It's very difficult to me to comment on, because uh, there's obviously a vast number of journals on the list, whether every single one of them is, is legitimate or not. Um, again, all I can say is that you need to use your skills as a researcher. One of those skills is triangulation, yeah? You're not going to, particularly if you're like a historian, you're not going to choose one source of information. In any branch of science, really, you're not going to choose one source of information. You're going to triangulate that, and you're going to look at two or three or four other sources that verify your primary source. So if your primary source is UGC care list, then that's, that's, that's a good you know, because, you know, the vast majority of the journals on there will be trustworthy, but you've got to triangulate and you've then got to look at, okay, who publishes in this journal? Does the editorial board members have email addresses or not? Does the, does the editor, whoever the editor or editors are, do, do they check out? Um, are the editors, are they well cited? When you think about it, <clears throat> there's a huge amount of research that is possible to do on an individual journal. Um, and you can do that using, for example, using Google Scholar. If you, do, if you don't have access to the databases we've been talking about, you can use Google Scholar to see, well, how well cited is the editor of this particular journal? If they are not very well cited at all, then that's, that will then put, put some doubt on, the, um, on your primary source. If they've got a huge number of citations across hundreds of publications, then that's a really good thing. It's very difficult, well nigh impossible to fake citations. So whilst Google Scholar isn't accurate, 
it certainly will give you an idea of whether whether somebody's citations are, are low or high. Um, so it may not be as accurate as, for example, the Web of Science, but it was certainly indicative. So um, my best my kind of best advice would be if there's some um, concerns about a journal, then you can then try and verify those concerns by by again doing your own research. Uh, so there's a reboot. I don't know. No, no, thank you, sir. We have another question uh, no? that has just come in. Somebody wants to know how do they get specific information about journals? How do they evaluate these journals? Like in case sometimes there are some upcoming journals as opposed to predatory ones. So how to make the distinction between new upcoming journals and trustworthy journals or predatory journals? Yes, it's a good point because new journals tend not to be indexed. Um, those the the organisations like Web of Science, like Cabell's, we like to see a proven track record of publication before we index a journal. So we'll want to see two, three, five years of publications before we actually index a journal. And that's sometimes that's that's a criticism. It's a fair criticism that people have because you can have a really really good new journal but it isn't included in, in the, these databases and these lists because it hasn't had time to build up the, that publication record. So that's where, again, you need to try and use your own, um, uh, your own research skills. So what I would say is firstly, then you need, to, as, as a researcher in your subject area, you should have a pretty good idea who, who is publishing in your area you know you're a researcher therefore you've done research you've done research about specific topics you will have read hundreds of articles by hundreds of different authors on those topics so you need to go back to those articles and find out firstly which journals were they published in and secondly um in terms of those authors then what references did they use and which journals were they referencing and you can start to build up a picture of those journals that people are publishing in regularly. Now, what you then need to do is look at your new journal, which won't have been referenced in those other more reputable journals, but look at who are the people involved in the new journal? Are they also involved in the reputable journals that you've seen in your reading? So you may well kind of pull together a list of 20 journals that you regularly read and you have regularly cited in your own research. And then those 20 journals will have, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 editors and maybe four or 500 editorial board members. And that's essentially your community. That's your research community. Now, how many of those are involved in this new journal? If there's a very small number, if only 10% of the people involved in, your new, in this new journal come from that established community, that's, that's not good. If it's 95%, then that's, that's really good because 95% of that established research community, they're not all going to be publishing in predatory journals. So that's where you need to do the research. You need to look at the publishing patterns of your peers and find out those people, are they involved in this new journal? Um, now that's not, potentially there are problems with that as we found. Some um, you may find a Margaret Stack, who's who's the editor of a of a really good automobile engineering journal, but she suddenly her identity has been stolen. So you've got to look behind, and those people, they need to say, okay, well, this journal says their editor is one of these people in the research community, but is it the, is it the real person? And this person should have on their 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 university website, for example, should have evidence that they're the editor of of that journal. So it's a question again of, of triangulation, of looking at where, what's, what's, what's happening, the evidence that you've got before you and checking out the links and the networks behind it to make sure it all adds up. Okay, thank you so much, sir. We have learned so much from you today on such a significant topic. Research scholars around the world need such precautionary webinars so they can avoid falling prey to these exploitative predatory journals. We want to thank you for helping us in informing and warning the Indian research scholars about the nature and practices of such journals. 
your insights on how to identify these journals will go a long way in helping us avoid and inform our fellow researchers about the journals. We need to be careful because not as researchers, we can and have to avoid researchers that has not been vetted, edited or peer reviewed. And you have to be careful also with these journals because uh, as you have mentioned, the research published by them is not at all reliable. And we might be in error when we use the same work in citing in our journal, in our research articles. And in fact, it is a threat to us as authors also, as we can lose our work and money as well. What I did not know previously was that India has the highest rate of predatory publications. This was something new that we learned today. And this makes this presentation all the more significant for all of us today. And we are fortunate that we have had this opportunity to learn from someone so knowledgeable and an expert on the topic. Let me congratulate you also on how well the presentation was organized and delivered. The slides are very helpful and we will upload this on our YouTube page and Facebook page so that people who are not able to join us today and who want to watch again or use them for uh, use this for the reference can also watch and avoid predatory in journals. Now I request Zeba Tamkanath, the Vice President at AIRS, to give the vote of thanks. Over to you, Zeba. Uh, hello, Ariba. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, I hope I'm audible right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, I would like to begin by saying that uh, it is also a true honor to hear Simon Lena. Lenacre to uh, speaking today, his lucid arguments, his enthusiastic delivery, and his command over the topic, uh, as well as the depth of his knowledge, were inspiring. Added to this, it was a pleasure to have such a, an enthusiastic participation from the audience. I thank the president of AIRS, Ariba Asanat Mazam, for conceptualizing, realizing, and bringing to fruition this inaugural this lecture. Uh, I would also like to thank Simon Lenacre for taking time out of his busy sed schedule to join us and giving us this enlightening lecture. I thank all the members of AIRS who have been working tirelessly to make these lectures possible, including Salma Jaha Mazam, Evangeline Nongkla, and Mohammed Farizuddin. We at AIRS are also grateful for the support, uh, enthusiasm, and determination of the president of AIRS, Ariba Ahsanat. And under her unfailing guidance, we have uh, yet again made another event possible. I thank you once, uh, all of you once again, and over to you, Ariba. Thank you, Zeva, for delivering the word of thanks. I want to thank all of you once again for joining us. And please fill the feedback form that has been provided in the chat box. Have a great night ahead. And I hope to see all of you in our next lecture on November 21st by Professor Hargopal on the future of social science research at 11 a.m. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Sneha, for collaborating with us for, with such a good, on such a good topic. And I want to wish all of you a great night ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Arima. Bye. Bye.